When you consume some carbs, those carbohydrates have two potential fates. The carbohydrates can go over to what's called an adipocyte, to a fat cell, and they can go into that fat cell and trigger more fat, or they can go over to the muscle cell and they can absorb into a muscle cell, create energy, or get stored as muscle glycogen. I think it's pretty obvious which one we want, right? Well, the cool thing is there are some ways that we can influence that a little bit more. Okay, it has to do with GLUT4 transporters. The best way that we can ensure that glucose is gonna get into the muscle and not into the fat cell is by increasing this GLUT4 transporter. It is a transporter that grabs the glucose out of the bloodstream and brings it into the cell, the muscle cell, to be used as energy or stored properly. Normally, this GLUT4 hangs out inside of the cell, okay, kind of sleeping, hanging out in the middle of the cell, waiting for a signal. When it gets a signal from insulin, then it wakes up and says, oh, okay, I gotta go do something, and it goes to the outer membrane of a cell. It's called translocation. Well, when it translocates, then it reaches out with its net and it grabs glucose and brings it into the cell. Well, up until recently, we thought that we needed insulin to translocate GLUT4. We absolutely thought that it was required. But now there's a lot of bodies of research that are showing there are independent ways to translocate GLUT4, to bring GLUT4 to the surface of a cell. There are independent ways outside of insulin to make sure carbs are getting into the muscle cell versus going into an adipocyte fat cell. For example, literally simply contracting and relaxing your muscles can translocate GLUT4, which brings me to number one. It's kind of a basic one that you've probably heard before, but hear me out, okay? When you work out or exercise, you are translocating GLUT4, period. It means that you can utilize carbohydrates independent of insulin. Okay, you don't need insulin to absorb carbohydrates when you're exercising. Because when you are exercising, you are changing what is called the ATP to AMP ratio. Okay, the ATP to AMP ratio is determining how much energy you're using. So if you have plenty of ATP and you're not using energy, your ATP to AMP ratio is, is fine, it's nice and high, right? But when that ratio changes, that means that there is a demand for energy because the ATP is dropping and your body is saying, oh, hey, we're running out of energy, we need glucose now. So independent of insulin, because it's so important and so in demand, that GLUT4 will translocate. Well, if you look at like, like fasting, for example, when we're fasting, we improve this ATP to AMP ratio as well because we're not consuming glucose, we're not consuming food, right? But with exercise, we are changing this ratio in the same fashion, except we are burning the glucose so fast that we have a demand for it. So right after exercise, you have a lot more flexibility in being able to consume carbohydrates, and that is why. So yes, you are definitely best as far as timing to align it around your workout, but post-workout, not pre-workout. Now let's move into another one, chromium. Chromium is so wicked cool, literally one of my favorite simple minerals, inexpensive supplements that you can add into your life. What chromium does is it makes the cell more sensitive to insulin, okay? So it's not working independently of insulin, it's enhancing the effect of insulin so you don't need as much. The Journal of Nutrition and Biochemistry published a paper that demonstrated that taking in chromium can increase the phosphorylation of the insulin receptor. What that means is it's enhancing the ability of the insulin receptor to do its job. The insulin receptor receives a signal from insulin to allow that GLUT4 to go to the outer membrane, okay? Well, think of it like a Wi-Fi signal. If your insulin receptor is weak and not really getting the signal, then that's not gonna work very well. But chromium is basically enhancing the Wi-Fi signal. So it's reaching out further and able to receive the signal from insulin a lot faster from a lot further away. So I see insulin coming way down the road. I'm gonna go ahead and translocate this GLUT4 so I can grab that glucose. That's exactly how it works. But the other thing that people don't talk about with chromium, because it is talked about a lot, is that it improves the cell membrane fluidity, which is so important. So if the membrane of a cell is fluid and just soft, it means that the GLUT4 can translocate a heck of a lot easier because it's a soft membrane. So it can go from inside to outside of the cell really easy. If our cell membranes are rigid and not fluid, think about it, it's a lot harder for something to move through. It's rigid and it has to push through it. So that fluidity makes a huge difference and that's another aspect that chromium adds to the mix. Now, there's something that you could combine with chromium, which is pretty cool, and that is utilizing green tea in a fairly concentrated amount, realistically, if you look at the data. So having green tea with a high-carb meal could be pretty effective at allowing glucose to go to the right spot. Now, full disclaimer, 
the evidence with the specific GLUT4 translocation is done in rodents, okay? That doesn't mean that it doesn't work in humans, but it also doesn't guarantee that it does. So full disclaimer. So what this was all about was EGCG, the active catechin that is in green tea, and how it affected translocation. It improved GLUT4 translocation. So this study was published in Biochemistry Biophysical Research Communications Journal, okay? And it took a look at rats and it gave them 75 milligrams of EGCG per kilogram of body weight. That's a good amount, but not ridiculous, okay? And it found that it helped translocate GLUT4 to the outer membrane of the cell, improving the ability to utilize glucose. What's wild is it did this even in insulin resistant rats. So it was definitely working independently of insulin, at least in the rodent models. But the good news is there are some human studies too. They just don't look specifically at the GLUT4. They didn't do the biopsies. So there's a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that took a look at, it was a meta-analysis, took a look at 17 randomized controlled studies, okay? 1,133 various subjects. And it evaluated green tea consumption. And it found that green tea did have a positive impact on glucose metabolism, glucose levels, HbA1c, and fasting glucose, fasting insulin levels. Okay. I mean, that's enough for me because that's how I feel. When I have green tea, I feel like my blood sugar is a little bit more stable. I feel like things are controlled a little bit more. But once again, that's just me. You know, by the way, like with carbohydrates, the kind of carbohydrates that you do eat matter, okay? Higher glycemic carbohydrates are going to load the system a lot faster. So you're gonna to have to be able to have a lot more sensitivity to handle it. Lower glycemic carbohydrates are going to trickle in a little bit slower. So you have more ability to handle it. Less ability to quote unquote spill over. Less ability to have extra carbohydrates run into the adipocyte and go into fat storage. So the right kind of carbohydrates do matter. So when you're going to the grocery store, Pay attention to the glycemic index. Pay attention to that glycemic load so you're not completely loading up on a bunch of high glycemic carbohydrates. Uh, in terms of like pantry staples, things like that, uh, I'll introduce you to Thrive Market. Down below, there's a link in the description. They're an online membership-based grocery store, but the cool thing is if you're shopping for carbohydrates or if you're doing keto or fasting or anything, it's awesome. They're a huge supporter and sponsor of this channel, but you can go and you can log on and you can sort by different food types. So if you wanted like gluten-free carbs or carbs that don't have sugar, things like that, you can sort by different diet type, by different ingredients. It's the coolest, most revolutionary way to shop. It's so awesome. And then it gets delivered right to your doorstep. So in a couple of days, you've got your pantry staples. They do have some perishable stuff too. They've got some meat, they've got some fish, stuff like that. It's, it really is becoming all encompassing. So anyway, they're a big sponsor in this channel. And because of that, that, I put a link down below that you can save 25% off of your initial order plus get a free gift when you use my link that's in the description. So do check out Thrive Market and a big thank you to them for the support and a thank you to you for supporting them to support us. Okay, this next one is wild. And I talk about it in my grocery haul videos. It's cinnamon. But the funny thing is with cinnamon, it sort of acts as a potential insulin mimicker. But the weird thing is, is initially when we first found out that cinnamon may have a positive impact uh, on glucose metabolism, it came from an Indian study that was actually looking at like muscle cell cultures, which is not how we want to prove a point. That is not at all, because things are different in a Petri dish than they are in the body. So that study kind of introduced things and made us aware of it. But then there was a small study that was published in Diabetes, Obesity, and Metabolism that took a look at just a small amount of people, and it gave them five grams of cinnamon versus a placebo, along with an oral glucose tolerance test of 75 grams of glucose. And they did find that the group that had the cinnamon ended up clearing out the glucose faster. But this was a relatively small test, so we couldn't prove a solid point with it, but it was definitely leaning that direction. The cool thing about this study is it also gave subjects five grams of cinnamon 12 hours before an oral glucose tolerance test and found that even having cinnamon 12 hours before made a tremendous difference in how they handled the glucose 12 hours later. That is unreal. So cinnamon seems to have a lasting effect. And the good news is because it pairs so well with sweet things, you can bake with cinnamon, potentially get a little bit more, I don't know, call it amnesty in terms of the glucose load. But then there was another study that was a little bit larger that was published in the Journal of Endocrinology Society. This took a look at 54 men, and these 54 men were pre-diabetic. And these 54 pre-diabetic men, they gave 500 milligrams of cinnamon to three times a day for 12 weeks. What's wild is throughout the 12-week period, the placebo group ended up worsening in their pre-diabetes, whereas the cinnamon group ended up staying about the same. So again, we're not saying the cinnamon is like this amazing, perfect fix-all, but clearly there's something going on there. Now, some evidence has shown that maybe it's what's called methyl hydroxychalcone polymer, which is an insulin mimicker, so it kind of acts like insulin, allowing glucose to suck up a little bit more. 
but it's pretty negligible. I think the bigger effect might be with GLUT4 translocation, but there's still a lot of research to be done. Okay, now this wouldn't be a complete video if I didn't give you something that was a more long-term solution. And I did a separate video on this before, but this one is about implementing what is called a 5-2 strategy. And this can help you out with glucose tolerance and utilizing glucose better over the longer term. The British Journal Nutrition had published this paper. Took a look at 115 women. Okay, now what they did is they said, okay, some of you are just gonna do a 25% caloric reduction. You're just gonna reduce your calories by 25%. Let's see how much weight you lose. Then the next group, they said, you are going to eat pretty normal ad libitum throughout the course of the week, but two days per week, you're gonna cut down to 600 calories, low carb, 40 grams of carbs. So pretty aggressive, five days eating normal, two days aggressive uh, caloric restriction. Another group followed that exact same aggressive caloric restriction plan on two days per week, but they were also allowed to eat as much fish, lean meat, eggs, polyunsaturated fats, monounsaturated fats as they wanted to, okay? Which is pretty wild. Here's what they found. Both of the five, two groups performed significantly better than the caloric restriction group. And they actually ate more calories generally. What's funny is that even the group that was able to eat an abundance of Mediterranean style fats and fishes and meats still ended up with much better results than the 25% caloric restriction group, especially when it came down to insulin sensitivity and the ability to utilize glucose. So this could be a longer term strategy where you say, hey, maybe just a couple days per week, I aggressively restrict calories and aggressively restrict carbohydrates, almost in an intermittent fasting model, but not even quite, just two strict days back to back where you're cutting calories tremendously. That right then and there, can improve insulin sensitivity. So your body is ready to translocate that GLUT4 and potentially get you carbohydrates going to the right place. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.